Okay, hello. Thank you all very much for being here. My name is John Ashmore. I'm the editor of CapEx, and I'm absolutely delighted to bring two excellent speakers to you today. Uh, on my left is Professor, uh, Dr. Frank Luntz, who By is the way, a. I, I resent that. I have never been on anyone's left, just so you know. Okay. <laughs> Physically on my left, uh, Dr. Frank Luntz. Uh, I'm sure most of you know who Frank is. He is a superstar of the world of polling and political communications. He's worked on campaigns all over the world in his native United States, in Australia, the UK, Ireland, and on Boris Johnson's campaign for the Oxford Union back in the late 80s. So he's uh, extremely insightful and extremely well-connected, and I'm sure we'll have plenty of interesting thoughts on the state of um, British politics and, and culture. He is a visiting fellow at our parent organization, the Center for Policy Studies, and has done a huge polling project earlier this year on the attitudes uh, and political language uh, of the UK. So we'll look forward to hearing more from that, on that from Frank. On my right is Professor Matt Goodwin. Matt is Professor of Politics at the University of Kent and a senior fellow at the Legatum Institute. He is the author of, by my count, six books. Is that right, Matt? And he has another one coming out uh, early next year uh, with Penguin. Um, I would also encourage anyone who isn't already following uh, Frank and Matt on Twitter to do so, because um, they both have plenty of excellent things uh, published on there. Right. Uh, in terms of the format, yes, sorry. can we, you guys, there's so many people back there. There are. If you guys, and you're going to have to move briefly, and they can get around here. Right up on the sides, where you see the Center for Policy Studies, those logos, if you want to bring 15 people forward, you can stand over yeah. there, and you're not going to be jammed. Don't be shy. Be able yeah. To see. I should have, yeah, I should have added from our previous events that as well as being a pollster and comms expert, Frank is also an expert on crowd control. Uh, <laughs> By the way, this is building back better. I want you to have better seats. <laughs> So you guys can stand against the wall, and we can put people against this wall here as well. So another 15 people can come forward, and you just stand against that wall there, give them space so they can cut through. Okay. Okay, we're going to charge you all five quid for standing there. Okay. So, yeah, um, Matt's books include uh, Revolt on the Right in 2015, one of the most sort of seminal works on the rise of UKIP and the, um, what became the Brexit Party, uh, national populism in 2018 as well. So we'll have plenty to get into um, on the realignment in British politics um, with Matt. In terms of the format, we're going to have a chat together for about 35, 40 minutes, and then I will take questions from the floor. There are so many of you here, I'm sure we'll have loads of questions. My only request ahead of time is think of your questions in advance, and please deliver your questions in the form of a question, um, and keep it to sort of 10 seconds, or I will try to cut you off. Um, right, Frank, to kick off, you came to the UK because you were kind of tired of the intensity and ferocity of the culture wars in your own company, uh, country. What is your assessment of where we are now in the UK compared to the United States in terms of that kind of division? You're in so much better shape in the UK than the US, and it is my single greatest fear. I went to Oxford, and I hated every minute of it, 84 to 87, I really did because the, the Brits were not, not nice to me. I was very much a supporter of Reagan. I was very much a supporter of Thatcher. And at Oxford University, they hated Margaret Thatcher, and they despised Ronald Reagan. And so for me to be back now and absolutely loving every minute of it and appreciating the country and the people, I want to make this clear so that no one misunderstands, those of you who are watching at home. The United Kingdom is a great country. You are great people. You have nothing to apologize for. In fact, the world owes you a grit of gratitude for the democracy that you created, for the economy that you created, for your values that you spread across the globe. I am thankful, and I'm glad to be here. OK, on the other hand, <laughs> America right now is so brutal. The politics, do not do this. Do not hate your neighbor. 
do not dehumanize or delegitimize your opponents. They are not enemies. You may disagree with them. You may fundamentally believe that they are wrong, but that is not an excuse to treat them like hell. And that is what has happened in America, that we actually attempt to justify this horrible, uncivil, undisciplined behavior. Politics, democracy, requires vibrant disagreement. But you don't delegitimize people. I have met one or two decent laborites in my life. I met a lot. And I met a lot from the Lib Dems. I've met a lot from the Greens. I've had a chance to travel up and down this country. And there is a greater degree of civility and respect in the UK than there is in the US. I conducted a focus group for the Times Radio, and they all talked to each other, and they were curious about each other. In America, it takes 45 seconds for someone to say, you're an idiot. I went for two hours here, and there wasn't a single insult by any individual. So be proud of your democracy, but be willing to fight for it too, which means don't go down the woke path. Don't go down the populism path. Don't behave the way our former president behaves, in the meanness and, and spitefulness, because you'll regret it in the end. We're running out of examples that we can point to, role models, either individuals or systems. Center for Policy Studies is the most brilliant think tank I know because they get so much done they actually produce policies that become law, rather than just talking about it. And you all who are here are taking part in a wonderful experiment of what you do coming out of a pandemic, coming out of various threats to this country, surviving. And by the way, the one thing, and the last point is, I've had the chance to be in Northern Ireland, I've had the chance to go to Wales, I've had the chance to go to Scotland, I've been toured around by MPs. I no, no longer call this Great Britain or Britain. I call it the United Kingdom because it is united. It should stay that way. And I hope that you all prioritize a united kingdom rather than just four different nationalities because that's what makes you special. Some excellent points there, Frank, particularly about how great the CPS is. Um, Matt, I think Frank strikes quite an optimistic tone there, uh, note there in the sense that we're not uh, a mirror of America's culture wars. But one thing we have seen here is a similar kind of realignment of party support. And how, much, how analogous do you think what's happened in Britain over the last sort of 10, 15 years is to what happened in, in the States with the, the change in report, uh, support for the Republicans? Yeah, well, thank you, uh, firstly, to CPS for arranging uh, this great event. The way I would uh, say it is that we are definitely on the same road as America, but we are a few miles behind. Uh, if you look at how the tectonic plates of British politics are changing, there are lots of similarities with how America has changed over the last three or four decades. Um, we are seeing much of the same uh, realignment that uh, that America has seen. The Conservative Party now has, in relative terms, more of a uh, working class following than at any other point in the post-war period, more so even than the era of Margaret Thatcher. The Conservative Party has become the principal representative for people without university degrees in the country. And the last, at the last election, uh, for the first time since 1997, the North-South divide narrowed significantly. Uh, we're seeing things in British politics that we haven't seen really before, um, and that really brings us to, to the debate that we're currently having in, in policy politics land, which is, is this temporary, just a byproduct of Brexit, or is it actually a permanent uh, realignment in, in British politics? My view certainly is that it is a long-term structural readjustment uh, that will likely continue uh, as we go forward, not, not diminish, and the reason I say that is because of some of the things Frank really pointed to, we do actually have the first signs of political polarization in British politics. If you ask 
uh, Remainers and Leavers, and we still feel very strongly about those identities, more so than our traditional party political identities. If you ask Remainers and leave Leavers, would you be happy if one of your relatives brought home somebody from the other side of the divide? About 40% of Remainers say they would be unhappy if their son or daughter brought home a Leaver, uh, and about 11% of Leavers say they would be unhappy if uh, their son or daughter brought home a Remainer. And there are many other, other uh, studies that we've had over the last year which suggest to us, I think, that actually we are uh, following America into uh, a more politically polarized um, environment. And I want to make one particular point, perhaps a provocative point, um, which is that the, the common narrative uh, about polarization is that it always comes from the right. And I think you heard that in some of Frank's comments about the the dark legacy of Donald Trump. And I'd agree with, with what Frank said. Um, I actually think the bigger problem over the next decade is coming from a particular group on the left of politics, which is uh, variously referred to as, as radical progressive politics, woke politics, illiberal liberals, et cetera, et cetera, who represent somewhere between 13 and 20% of the country, who, as Frank's research and similar studies by Kings, um, more in common among others, they are all telling us the same thing, that that group is very intolerant of other ideological perspectives, is um, very negative in how it thinks about Britain, its history, its identity, its culture, um, is uh, very active in politics, uh, very active in media, very active in universities, um, and is increasingly, I think, leading us into a path that is very different from the path that Frank rightly pointed to, which is our civic culture. Why is Britain different from other European countries and other countries around the world historically? It is because of our civic culture. We weren't like some of our neighbors uh, in the mid 20th century. We emphasized compromise, we emphasized consensus. We didn't do emotional, dogmatic politics. Unfortunately, we now do emotional, dogmatic politics, uh, and uh, I have yet to see um, uh, anybody on the political spectrum come up with a serious strategy and a serious response for what we're going to do about that, um, because it is only going to grow. It's not going to diminish as we go forward, uh, for reasons that I'm sure we'll come back uh, to speak about, but uh, that's a more pessimistic take on where we are than Frank's optimism. Thanks very much, Matt. Um, Frank, what would your response be to that? If you were advising your old friend Boris Johnson, how does he operate in this world of emotional, dogmatic politics um, that Matt has described? Is he there to capitalize on culture wars or to try and salve the British people and bring, bring us together? So I'll give you an example. We surveyed 1,000 women last month, and we asked them, would you have relations with the prime minister if you could? <laughs> 21% said never again. <laughs> As I said yesterday, we have a new definition of chaos. Father's Day at 10 Downing Street. Uh, he's, he's brilliant. He's brilliant because he's different. I watched it yesterday. I was at the Scottish uh, event last night. By the way, the biggest difference between the US political system and the British political system, I don't know how you guys are up this morning based on what you drank last night. <laughs> uh, this, this, is, this could be, you could actually keep Alcoholics Anonymous in business forever. <laughs> He's there and everyone is grabbing at him. I couldn't imagine people grabbing at Jeremy Corbyn except to push him off a cliff. Uh, everybody wanted their selfie with him. Everybody wanted to touch him. He is unique in politics. He's a genuine rock star. And if I were advising him, I would actually say to people around him, leave him alone, because he's magic. He gets people who've never voted conservative before to consider voting conservative. He gets people who will say, I grew up labor, my parents were labor, my grandparents were labor, my great-grandparents were labor, my great-great-grandparents were French, so we don't talk about them. He, because of who he is and how he communicates, 
My advice to him is don't do anything differently. Now, CPS is going to challenge him for raising taxes. CPS is going to challenge him for spending too much. CPS is going to challenge some of the policies on housing and welfare, and that's the job of people in this room. But his job is to be Boris Johnson. And as long as he does that job well, you're going to keep the majority, and you could even gain seats. Please, yell at your chancellor. Yell at everybody else. Leave Boris alone to be Boris. And Matt, just picking up on that, um, how much mileage do you think there is for Boris and, and his team in pursuing a kind of culture-heavy agenda? A lot of people think with the reshuffle and putting the Dean Dorries in at culture, there's a statement of intent that we're going to that we're going to see the Tories really go for that. And given the sort of severity of the economic problems the country's facing, is, there, is it a politically wise thing to do, or should they stick to the real bread and butter stuff? Yeah, I mean, I think, unfortunately, we tend to still view politics through a left-right economic divide, and we tend to always assume that economic scarcity, economic competition is the dominant driver, and it, it's just not true anymore. I mean, look at the last decade in British politics. I mean, the key messages, for me at least, is that actually the, the rules of the game have changed in, in important ways. The most important group for the Conservative Party today, in my view at least, is the cross-pressured voter, the voter that leans uh, a little bit to the left on some economic issues, not all of them, um, but some of them, and leans a little bit right on culture. So they want somebody to make the economy a bit fairer. Uh, they want uh, somebody to make Brexit a success. They want to have control over migration. They don't want to end all immigration, but they do want less immigration. Um, and they typically believe the system is rigged against them. There's one law for the rich and another for the poor. Um, that conflicted, cross-pressured voter is essentially what delivered the Conservative Party the Red Wall. There are lots more of them, by the way, and I think Frank is right to say the Conservatives could easily add seats. The Red Wall 2.0 uh, extends well beyond the current Red Wall, as many Labour MPs who are today clinging on low majorities in many of the same seats that are filled with non-graduates and working class voters will tell you. Now, why are those voters switching to the Conservative Party? It's not just because of economic aspiration. It's because uh, they perceive the Conservative Party to stand up for the nation, to stand up for uh, the national community, to stand up for history, heritage, um, and uh, tradition, things that we're not very good at talking about in politics, but which mean a great deal to most voters. They feel proud of Britain. They are more likely to see the positive side of our history. They don't just want to dwell on the negative side of our history. Uh, they don't want to be told to apologize for their inherent privilege. Uh, and they don't want to see, uh, as far as they uh, see it through their eyes, every institution uh, being turned uh, around into an anti-British uh, lens. Uh, every time Boris Johnson stands up and says, uh, I'm going to put British history first, I'm going to uh, speak about the positives when it comes to uh, our history, uh, Winston Churchill, uh, symbols of nationhood, he's onto a winner. And this is primarily why the Labour Party has been losing uh, workers and non-graduates who feel far more attached to the nation than other voters. I mean, the blunt reality is that uh, the groups that the Labour Party is now dependent upon in the cities and the university towns, uh, graduate Zoomers uh, uh, and uh, much more diverse populations, uh, feel very differently uh, about the nation. They don't prioritize national attachment. They prioritize typically individual achievement. They prioritize educational and professional success. They think very differently about these issues. There's nothing wrong with how they think about them. They just think very differently about them. And so the Labour Party's problem is it's sort of been stacking up votes in areas where it doesn't need votes and losing votes in areas where it needs votes. And in those areas, you've got lots of voters who care deeply about the country. And they want Britain to succeed. They don't want to wake up every day and be told about you know, how crap the country is or what's going wrong. And I think that is played very nicely into what Frank has alluded to, which is Boris Johnson's instinctive strengths, his inbuilt advantages. Like we're talking this morning as if you know, the issue of uh, petrol shortages um, and the price of uh, cereal is going to affect Boris Johnson's popularity. Um, I personally don't think it is going to. I think the, the more that voters instinctively believe that he is 
leaning much more towards seeing the positive side of the country, uh, then I think he's going to be uh, onto a winner. And just for the last point, and this perhaps segues into something that Frank showed in his research, I was struck by the finding, Frank, in your survey uh, when you looked at Labour voters and um, the sort of liberal left side of the spectrum, uh, the extent to which feelings of shame and pride differentiate voters on the left of the spectrum and voters on the right. Um, and I think this is one of the primary challenges facing the Labour Party and other left-wing parties across the country, across the world. And we've seen it in the US. The reason Biden didn't get a big majority, and I'm sure you'll come on to this, I think is because the progressive left alienated a lot of voters, including African-American and Latino and Hispanic voters. And where does that leave politics going forward? Because I'm cl clearly of the view that the pro-anti-nation axis is now going to become much more important in politics than it, than it has been uh, in recent years. And to take that one step further, you have an opportunity, and I have not seen it so far, and I'm watching for it, which is there are two different Labour parties right now. There's the Labour Party of London, and there's the Labour Party of the North. And the Labour Party of London keeps telling the Labour Party of the North, you're privileged. You're, you, you got all these great advantages, and they're looking and saying, where? What have I got? You can't show it to me. And I believe that if the conservatives start talking about London labor, that will pull away some of those final people in the North who are trying to decide where they want to go. It's social, it's cultural, not just economic, but the difference between London labor and the rest of labor is night and day. And I'm waiting to see the conservatives jump on that. Second, as far as Joe Biden, Joe Biden is so old it takes him an hour and a half to watch 60 Minutes. <laughs> this guy is so old, his favorite painting is The Last Supper. If you look carefully, he's the second waiter from the left. <laughs> Biden is so old, the only time he doesn't have to pee is when he's peeing. That one's my favorite, by the way. The, the challenge and, and the warning is that to define yourselves by what you're not got you to 219, got you to, uh, tw sorry, 2019. To define yourselves by what you are takes you the final step, gets you to a majority that they can never close. You can say who you're not. You can criticize socialism. You can criticize the Labor Party leadership. I think Peter Mandelson's one of the best strategists I have ever met anywhere. And he came up with the, with the, the statement, Lose, lose, actually it's lost, lost, lost. Blair, 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 lost, 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 lost. 10, I consider that a loss, 15, 17, 19. He's right, but that's not good enough for you in this room. I assume you still want better. And the way that you get to better is by telling people what you are for and by changing them. Don't indoctrinate them, that's a labor approach. Labor tells you what you should think. The conservatives should empathize and communicate, but not try to indoctrinate. I know you're going to jump in. Build back better should not be a slogan. It should be a commitment. You make it a commitment, and you will never lose the majority. I am going to jump in. Um, <laughs> that's, uh, I mean, Tory conference is not normally the place I go to for strategy advice for Labour, but... <laughs> Matt, what would you say? I mean, they, they seem to me so far off the pitch at the moment, but it, I mean, is there a route back for them at all? Do they need a total revamp? Uh, well, they're not going to win the next election. Um, the strategic structural problems are too great. Um, the blue wall isn't anywhere near big enough. Uh, about 20 seats, maybe 20, 30 seats in the blue wall. But as they win, those seats, it's likely we'll see a continuation of the realignment across much of northern England and the Midlands. We've already seen, I think, at this conference, Boris Johnson trailer the, um, uh, the crackpot coalition line uh, that if you vote Labour, you'll, you'll get Labour in the SNP, um, which, as we know from 2015, was very devastating because uh, that line mobilises England. Uh, the Labour Party has not won the popular vote in England since 2001. England is 
a different galaxy for the Labour Party outside of London and the university towns. The Labour Party doesn't know what to do with England, doesn't understand uh, England, has never really known uh, how to relate to, to England in recent political history. And it's the, it's the predominant challenge facing the Labour Party. How do you win back those voters? There is no path back to power for Labour that doesn't run through England. Uh, so it's very, very difficult. And many Labour strategists tell themselves that actually the Conservative Party is now dependent upon old white people who don't represent a future coalition. I remember Stan Greenberg in the US telling me the exact same thing before the Republicans won in 2016. Uh, the average age at which you become more likely to vote Conservative in the UK at the last election dropped from 47 years of age in 2017 to 39 years of age in 2019. And at the lesson from the last US election as well is that coalitions change. I mean, Donald Trump, bizarrely, left the last election with a more diverse coalition than Mitt Romney had, you know, which is crazy when you think about it, but he made inroads among Latino, Hispanic, Asian Americans, African Americans, and so on. And many, many voters uh, having instinctively conservative views on issues like crime, which again is becoming more relevant in British politics as well. So I think, you know, the coalitions change too, and not in a way that, that may instinctively help the Labour Party. But more fundamentally like, than any of that, I, I still think deep down that social democracy was fundamentally built for the 20th century when the primary conflicts were economic. It was about the economy, it was about public services, and I'm not saying it's the end of the road for social democracy, because you can see in countries like Germany, where there is some sort of coalition between the centre-left and the Greens, or the centre-left and Lib Dems and so on, that you can cobble together. But the, the foundations for social democracy have simply become much, much weaker uh, than they once were, because voters don't just want to talk about cost of living, they don't just want to talk about the economy, they want to talk about all of these cultural issues, which is why Brexit went the way it did, it's why the Conservative electorate looks the way that it that does at the moment. So I think the advice for the Labour Party is, is stabilise internally, get through the next election, um, and then somehow start to reboot uh, the message for these voters that don't look like um, Hampstead and look much more like Hartlepool. Um, if you're waiting around for the Zoomers and the graduates to bring you to power, you're going to be waiting about 20 years. And we would forget this. Only a quarter of the country have a degree, right? I mean, the, the, the demographic uh, tide argument is a long-term argument. It's a generational argument, and it's not even one that is guaranteed to deliver election success. I remember my colleagues in political science making the same argument in 1950 that the Labour Party would dominate the post-war period because of the demographic changes that were happening. And I think it's, there are no easy answers for the Labour Party. I'd like to say go look at Denmark and become a little bit more culturally conservative, but Labour activists will never allow that to happen. And so we end up with Keir Starmer going on television saying that actually it's wrong to say that only women have a cervix. There's no easy answers for the Labour Party. Are you guys more economic conservatives or social and cultural conservatives? I'm going to ask you to vote, and you have to choose. Do you identify yourself as an economic conservative? And we're losing the Times radio person, and this is actually, we're going to make news right yeah. now. Which is it, Carol? Yeah. <laughs> so if you're an economic conservative more than social and cultural, raise your hands. And let's the other side. If you are, if you can't follow, then you can't follow. If you're a social or cultural conservative, raise your hands. <laughs> so you're still more economic than cultural. This is a capex event, though. So yeah. it's a <laughs> lot of Thatcher, I'd say. Um, the the way that labor could come back would be to return to the days of somebody like Tony Blair, but they're not going to do that. My fear. And by the way, the average age of a conservative voter is deceased. So that's another problem. <laughs> I, we were polling people from 2019, literally while we were on the phone doing the interview, we were losing people, they were dying. <laughs> so you gotta, get, you gotta get younger, but social media is a problem here, and I'm always the doomsayer, I'm always the negative person on the panel, and I'm gonna do it again. If you, if politics, and it's gonna happen, continues to stay 
driven more and more by social media, it's going to get uglier and uglier because you are rewarded for being mean. You are rewarded for being negative. And some of you here probably don't get any of your politics from social media, but if you're under the age of 40, you're not reading a newspaper, you're getting it on the web. And it is pure poison. It is toxic. I have no solution to it. My only observation is I don't know how any democracy in the end survives what social media does to it. Thanks, Frank. Um Matt, as well as being you know, a political analyst, you're also a working academic, and one of the kind of the, the hub of the woke movement in the US has been universities. I mean, what's your own personal experience of working on a campus in the UK, and how, how bad do you think it is in terms of academic freedom? Well, the debate cuts in two. You either think the threats to academic freedom are a myth that are being pushed by the right to drive culture wars, which is the view of many of my colleagues, um, or you... Uh, share my view, which is that we have a very serious problem with freedom of speech and intolerance, not just within universities, but within a myriad of institutions. Um, a wonderful piece this morning in The Times uh, on that very issue. The Economist as well had a very good recent issue on intolerance within universities. And this, again, I think is where the US gives us, um, gives us a warning sign. Uh, if you go into higher education in the US, um, I mean, it's not over, but the search for objective truth and reason has um, certainly suffered um, a few devastating blows. Um, trust in universities among Republicans especially has collapsed. Uh, and I'm very worried that Britain's leading universities, I mean, this is one of our greatest exports. Uh, you know, I mean, it, we, we have some of the best universities in the world um, and unfortunately, they are, um, in my view at least, undermining themselves by not remaining committed to viewpoint diversity, uh, freedom of speech, and different perspectives. Uh, I've had friends who have been sacked and disinvited. Um, the most rigorous surveys that we have, if you say, well, that's just anecdote, the King study suggests 25% of all university students in the UK are self-censoring in seminars and lectures because they don't feel comfortable to share their views. The UCU, which is the main union for people like me, which denies we have an issue, released a survey showing 35% of academics are self-censoring their views in uh, uh, lectures, seminars, and at work to, uh, uh, because of their fear of the consequences. I could talk you through how people who accept the vote for Brexit or who hold gender critical views or who hold a nuanced view of the legacy of empire are treated. If you spend any time on my Twitter feed, you'll know that this is not um, uh, the, the ramblings of a madman, but we have a serious issue. And I just want to say thank you to the Conservative Party for passing the, or being about to pass the Higher Education Academic Freedom Bill, uh, which at least, uh, from my perspective, is one of the most important pieces of legislation um, in higher education, which will allow people who are being persecuted for their political views, will allow them the opportunity to uh, have oversight of those decisions and for universities to be sanctioned if uh, they violate freedom of speech and academic freedom. This is a trailblazing piece of legislation that I think has big implications for the US for Canada, for France, where academics are debating the same thing, which is how do we ensure that people are not discriminated against and persecuted against simply for having non-conformist views on mainstream issues. People may say we don't want the state intervening in universities. I used to think like that. But then I realized that actually when some institutions are left to themselves, the monoculture becomes so strong that there will never be any correction and it will just continue. And as Cass Sunstein and others have shown, when you have very strong monocultures, they just become more radical and more radical over time. Uh, and I don't want to have any more students coming into my office or colleagues coming to, to speak to say, actually, I feel that I'm being bullied, I feel that I'm being harassed, I feel that I'm being intimidated. So we have a serious issue, but I'm glad that actually Boris Johnson and the Conservative Party put that in the manifesto and are, have been delivering on it. Um, so thank you to the Conservative government for doing that. And Frank, what chance do you think of uh, a similar academic freedom bill getting into law in, in the US? Not great, because the people in charge now would be against it. Um, I, 
you do have. You've got two of the greatest universities on the face of the earth, and they seem to be, seem to be, I have to be careful because I enjoy going up to both those universities, so I will not mention them. But I'm actually... The University of Kent, obviously, is one of the two. <laughs> you, are, you are witnessing self-censorship right here, right now. But I, I am afraid that if I was any more explicit, it would have an impact on me. Okay. Guys, we've got so many people here that I'm actually going to go to the Q&A a little bit earlier than I might ordinarily do. Um, I'm going to take them in two. So stick up your hand if you want to ask a question. I'm just going to go from the front for the sake of... Brevity, um, you there, sir, and on the right there. My colleagues will come around with a mic. Thank you very much. And actually, just so you know, I would have told them to always start in the back. <laughs> but that's that's like crowd ma again, crowd management. Yeah. The I've front got get the benefit. Seminar with Frank after this. Uh, <laughs> um, Mark Woods from Hemel Hempstead. Um, Keir Starmer's not an idiot. Keir Starmer knows all the things you've said, and he's going to try to look to the population like Blair. Do you think he can succeed? Lovely short question there. <laughs> okay, and you, sir? Thank you, um, I'm Toby Williams from Whitton. Um, my question is, uh, to what extent should the Conservative Party's response to the um, change of the tectonic plates, the shifting of the tectonic plates in British politics be a return to a more traditional one nation form of conservatism, a um, Burkean, Disraelian, Macmillanite sort of conservatism. And if that should be our response, um, I'd be interested to know if there's an irony there, seeing as uh, the, the, the Brexit movement uh, was driven in part, at least by the right of the Conservative Party. Okay, two great questions there. So um, can Keir Starmer do anything to Im imbibe the lessons of the panel? I'm gonna do the second question because oh. I'm actually gonna give you 10 words that will, if anyone here is ever running for office, I'm gonna give you 10 words that'll help you get elected, okay. but that's appropriate to your second question. I'm gonna leave you right. the labor so, question. Matt, I mean, K does Keir Starmer have a prayer? Basically, it's a bit of a similar one to the one I asked you before about labor being off the pitch, but you know, strategically, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> you do much. Every, every opposition leader has a chance. It's not to say he doesn't have a chance. I, j I just personally think it's very, very unlikely. I think Keir Starmer is a, is a very nice man. Um, I've, who I've got to, I've done a few events with him. I think his heart is in the right place, but I think his um, his image in the eyes of voters is deeply problematic. His leadership ratings are nowhere near Johnson's. More fundamentally, for many voters in those cross-pressured Labour heartlands, he is the guy that took a lead in trying to overturn the vote for Brexit. And people can keep saying. We've moved on from Brexit. Brexit doesn't matter anymore. We're not talking about that. I'm doing focus groups. It's coming up. You know, if you're a Labour Party now, I have no idea why the front bench has Ed Miliband on it. Um, you're not alone. David Lammy, um, Keir Starmer. I think the optics for the Labour Party generally are terrible because the optics are, are just entrenching what Frank rightly points to as, as London Labour. You know. Lisa Nandy is, is perhaps different, um, but I think they need to radically diversify. And I still don't know what Keir Starmer believes. I don't know what he wants to do with the country. I, and I, you know, like all of you, I suspect, I watch most of the politics programs and read most of the um, op-eds. I still don't know where Starmer wants to go and what he wants to do. And more fundamentally, I think whether he can really control the Labour Party as it is currently organized. And I think for many voters, that too is, is one of the concerns that comes up, which is, am I voting for Starmer or am I voting for the activists that last week voted 70% against the AUKUS deal? You know, who am I voting for uh, when I'm voting for the Labour Party? And that is a, a massive problem uh, for Starmer, not unique to him. And just the last point is we tend to view everything through the lens of, of our politics, but um, the structural problems that I've talked to that are facing centre-left parties are by no means unique to Britain. Um, it would be an absolute catastrophe for Labour, by the way, if they were to push for proportional representation for a number of those reasons. A Labour electorate is just about to completely 
um, fragment into three or four blocks, uh, and it's only not doing that at the moment because we have a first-past-the-post system, uh, which is just about managing to hold it together. But I think Starmer is, um, is unfortunately, he's a nice guy, but I don't think he's a guy that's going to be taking Labour back to power. Mm. So something uh, rather negative for Labour, something a bit more positive for the Tories. Um, Frank's going to give a bit of a campaign pep talk. But it's not. Okay. It's language because I'm responding to you by saying you shouldn't have that fight. Or you can have that fight in rooms like here because it's appropriate in rooms like here. But publicly, it's not. And there is a language that gets beyond it, a language that is uniquely UK uniquely of the people rather than the politicians. I'm going to use this as an example so I can get myself into lots of trouble. The slogan here on the, on the front page of the book, getting on with the job. What was Boris's slogan about Brexit? Get it done. Why did he get 80, an 80 seat majority? Get it done. You tell me, getting on with the job or getting it done? Which would you rather vote for? Who says getting on with the job? Camera should film this. The one guy who didn't hear me before chooses getting on with the job. <laughs> who says get it done? It's obvious. Another example, you guys talk about sustainability. Good for you for being concerned about the environment, for caring about the next generation. You're the most pro-environmental of any right of center party that I know of. But sustainability is the status quo. What does the public want? Cleaner, safer, healthier. Er, clean er, safe er, it's better than the past. Third example, this government put forward a crime initiative, a crime policy a couple months ago, talked about crime. When people hear the word crime, they think of uh, knife crime or they think of, of cops and confrontation. It should have been public safety. If you're Challenging the government, you talk about crime. If you're in the government, it's about public safety because that's safe streets, safe neighborhoods, the ability to walk around at night and not be afraid. Three examples of language that's not being used effectively right here. Another example, healthy, and this has nothing to do with the NHL's S. Healthy schools, healthy neighborhoods, healthy families, a healthy economy, healthy workplace environment. That word healthy indicates success. It's what everybody wants. I don't hear it. I got uh, six more. Responsible. One of the reasons why they don't like politicians in this country, and it's legitimate, is that they feel that they put politics ahead of responsibility, that they put their own occupation ahead of the people they represent. So if you take responsibility or you act in a responsible fashion, you're doing exactly what voters want. Another example, the word imagine. The most powerful word in the English language. If I ask you to imagine life at perfection, everyone in this room, and this room's packed, everyone in this room would have a different imagine. Instead of telling people what to think or what to dream, or how to dream, which is what labor does, give your voters the chance to do that. Ask them to imagine the UK, the greatest success, the greatest opportunities. Let them decide. And by the way, one of the things that I should have done when I first started was to ask you a question. I screwed up. I should have put it back to you that there are so many people standing in the back of the room. What do you want to learn? A conservative MP walks into the room, gives a 10-minute presentation, and then takes questions. That's wrong. You should walk into the back of the room and open it up to them Find the people who came the furthest, who have sat down the longest, and see what's on their minds before you tell them what's on your mind. Put it in the perspective of the voters. Another surprise to me, safe and secure, strong and stable. I know that was the campaign slogan of, uh, of Theresa May. Even she couldn't ruin those words. <laughs> the, they are still as powerful today as they, as they have ever been because the public wants a safe and secure country. And if they don't feel they're getting it, if you had put a little more money into Sean Bailey's campaign, if you actually had treated him, taken him seriously, he could have won. And by the way, I do want to say this, because I am, I don't believe in, in 
gender politics. I don't believe in choosing people based on how they look. I think that's where you get into trouble. But you invite people in. If we truly believe in a race-blind, gender-blind, income-blind, opportunity-blind, merit society, then you should put performance at the center of your policies, to get back to your comment. It's not whether it's Keynesian or Freeman-esque or all that stuff that no one understands except people in this room. If you earned it and you deserved it, you should benefit from it and get to keep it. So this is language that will appeal to everyone. Please pay attention, because this is how you strengthen your democracy, by putting people first. Okay. Thank you very much, Frank. Um, we will have another question. The lady on the left over there, please. You always go to your left. No, I don't. I went right before. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, we'll have, and uh, the gentleman with the glasses and the gray suit there as well, please. Who's on the right? I want to emphasize Who's on the right. On the right. We're an ecumenical organization. So, uh. Thank you so much. My name is um, Councillor Gloria O'Para uh, from Medway. Great discussions. Thank you so, so much. Um, Obviously, I'm hugely proud of our achievements. You know, the red walls coming down and us becoming a truly united kingdom. Um, as someone who is from the, an African origin, obviously, of the Commonwealth here, I'm aware that there is a section of community, of society, that is nervous when we hear about you know, making this a truly Great Britain and taking back control and, and what have you. It, it kind of builds this atmosphere of nervousness where they are thinking, do I fit in to this new Britain? And I'm also aware of there's a section of society that feels that the immigrant community, uh, you know, with, within this new United Kingdom should be relegated to a place where you know, they maybe remain at the bottom or never ever show up again. So what do we do or what else can be done to assure the immigrant community that they have a strong place within this new United Kingdom? Because you know, we can build back better when we are united. And also, what can we do to educate those sections of our society that still look at the immigrant community as though we are foreigners that should be excluded from you know, this new United Kingdom. Thank you. I know you want to go to him. Your chancellor is awesome. Your, your health secretary is awesome. Your home secretary is awesome. You've got the most diverse leadership in this country of any right of center party I've ever seen. If they aren't an example of success, I don't know what is. If they aren't great role models, I don't know what is. And for those of you who are political, talk to her and get her to run. The way that you do that is for you to become a role model for others to follow. Uh, gentlemen, over. Thank you. Uh, Charles Perestory, Southampton, Inching Conservatives. Uh, questions for Matt. Uh, in your view, does the higher education bill go far enough to protect um, academic uh, freedom of speech? Um, and if not, or just a couple of ideas, is it wh what would your thoughts be on withholding grant funding and tying that to universities' performance on protecting academic freedom of speech? And secondly, uh, not providing student loan backing for undergraduates to the universities that fail to meet uh, academic freedom of speech, given that's such a big revenue stream for universities now. Okay, Matt, do you want to pick up on... Well, we should definitely get a drink over the conference. <laughs> uh, um, just, just before I come to that, another just brief comment about the ex excellent question. Um, it sort of goes back to my opening remarks about the sort of very radical view of Britain that, that I think is a very warped view of Britain that is also being pushed, which is that, especially since Brexit, that we are a fundamentally racist, intolerant country uh, all of the empirical evidence that we have says the exact opposite. Um, you look at the most reliable, rigorous surveys we have in the country, they show that levels of prejudice in Britain have never been lower 
in our recorded history. Uh, that ever since the vote for Brexit, people have become more positive about uh, immigration and its impact on the country. Uh, they, we have large majorities that say they would like to welcome international students, Hong Kongers, Afghan interpreters, high skill uh, migration. And one of the big stories about the country that is very concentrated in particular parts of the country is actually a, a myth. Um, and what I would like to see is a bigger pushback at actually, I might say, deconstructing uh, that myth. Uh, because it is incredibly uh, damaging to be pushing a view, especially among students, for example, that you're born into a structurally oppressive, uh, fundamentally racist society. We either believe in evidence and objective truth or we don't. Right? If you want to just make stuff up and say everything's socially constructed and culturally constructed, great. But I don't think personally you should be wielding serious power in British society. Um, and I'd like us to see, see us make that argument more forcefully, that, that things are moving in a positive direction and we should focus on the, on the ups. Um, we can always go further. My big hope with universities now is that as the legislation passes, Universities love a league table. Um, I predict within a year, some genius out there, in fact, someone in this room, could set up an academic freedom league table to monitor universities. Who will do that? Someone here, I'm sure, will do that. And because the moment you do, every university in the country will be falling over themselves to be at the top of that league table. And hopefully then we won't need some of the things that you point to, and nor will we have academics like my colleagues and others who have been asked about their political views at research grant interview panels, which is, you know, something that shouldn't be happening in contemporary Britain. So hopefully, a year from now, uh, a wonderful think tank will have such a lee table, and that will help, I think, bring about culture change. That's brilliant. I'm going to bring that to the States. That is brilliant. That is the that will be the best thing. I'll charge you for it, Frank. Okay. <laughs> uh, if anyone of my colleagues wants to get working on that, then uh, now's the time. Um, uh, lady in the blue there, and the gentleman the in the front row here who's been his hand up several times. Um, you guys you in the back, off? sorry, you're just going to have to come up close if you want um, to get. Gentleman in the front row can kick off with a question. Guys, I don't, I don't know if you've um, heard of it. Frank, you might have done, because you, you've done work in Australia. Have any of you heard of the Liberal MP in Australia called Nicole Smith? She was basically treated very, very badly by the far left of the Australian Labour Party in the last federal election. Now, my argument is, is if you want women to get involved in politics, you want anybody from any minority to get involved in politics, if they're attacked as she was badly and she was protected by the AFP, am I the only person that thinks the leaders should come out fighting, metaphorically I mean, to protect um, to defend these people rather than having somebody as, as sound as she is leaving the federal parliament. Am I the only person that thinks the, le the leaders need to um, defend their okay. members when they're attacked? So the first question was, do, do, yeah, do leaders need to pretend, particularly women who are being attacked? I think the case of Rosie Duffield um, in the Labour Party is a prime example of that, where Keir Starmer did sod all to protect her for voicing the same views that pretty much everyone in the country holds. Um, <laughs> sorry, a bit of editorialising from me there. Um, the, Lady in the blue there. Hi, my name is Sophia. As you can probably tell by my accent, I'm more from Frank's side of the pond. Um, uh, I actually wrote my dissertation on populism, and a lot of the research that I read said that the personalization of politics that you see in the US because of the presidential system is a negative thing. But we talked a lot about Boris as Boris. So I was wondering if the members of this panel think that the personalization of politics and focusing on the personal aspects of our leader is a positive, and if it's not, what should we do instead? Okay, Frank, do you want to take us up on the second question there? Do you think personalization is a positive thing or not? And then they're actually written down, personalize, individualize, and humanize, even before you ask that question. It's going to happen no matter what, and in America, we are actually more personality focused than you are here. You've got PMQs, which is the most brilliant, I think it's the best exchange I, I'm a geek, and I would actually set my schedule so that I could watch it live. I'd get up early to be able to see it. Uh, and it's a wonderful 
opportunity to watch the parties go back and forth. That's why it pers personality matters. You're more, th this country is more policy oriented than almost any democracy. So if you think that you're too personality driven because of Boris, you still have a better discussion of housing policy, a better discussion of education, a better discussion of welfare and crime than we have had in 20 or 30 years. So actually, this to me is the, is the model for how to follow it. Uh, we can't tell people what to pay attention to. They're gonna pay attention to what they choose. We've got a couple media people over here. They're gonna cover what they cover. If we're controversial, if we say something out of the really extreme, that's gonna make the news. Not if we give something that people are already expecting. So there's no way to change that. It's just how social media is, it's how, how the press cover it, and it's the way the politicians act. The problem is when you seek to destroy. And actually, I learned this in Bill Clinton's, when Bill Clinton was president, because the people around him sought to destroy the credibility of their opponents. And that is politics and it's elections, but it really does wreck the political process. But there's no way, if it works, people use it. And Matt, I mean, is it a risk for the Tories if they go in too heavily on Boris Johnson personally, if that when he's gone, the brand then kind of collapses? No, I, I completely agree with Frank at the beginning, actually. I think Boris is a huge advantage for the Conservative Party. Um, to give you an idea, every time we analyze um, why people flipped from Labour to the Conservatives in 2019, why they voted for Brexit in 2016, uh, liking Boris Johnson is a, one of the most significant drivers of that. Uh, it's a huge effect. I mean, it would be, I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to say classic Conservative politics to, you know, you guys like to get rid of leaders, um, but uh, it would be a huge mistake. I mean, Johnson is, is dynamite. Uh, in terms of how voters perceive him. I mean, I don't want to take it down to the level of anecdote, but for the first time in a long time, I'm talking to my non-political friends about politics because they quite like Boris. It's that kind of cut through that you, that you get with, with only a certain few kinds of leaders. I think Blair certainly had it for a while. Um, Cameron never really had it. May, I think we <laughs> all know that <laughs> happened there. Um, but Johnson certainly has that, and you can't bottle that up. Um, and it's also, it has a Teflon status. You know, just look at the polling, and even if you're suspicious of polls, which I don't really think we should be, given they, on balance, they have a better record than not in the UK. You know, we, we, we are not only on the cusp of the longest period of conservative rule since the early 1800s, eclipsing even the Thatcher and major years, um, but we have had one Labour poll lead uh, in the last 200 opinion polls, um, which is remarkable. And the reason that the conservative vote is so stable and static is not just because of the realignment and the, the cultural meshing with the, with the economic, but, but is primarily because of Johnson, uh, that people think his, his heart is in the right place, they think he's going to stand up when it matters. Um, and they're willing to give him the benefit of the doubt. And Frank will correct me, but there, there was an exchange that I think tells us a lot about British politics from American politics, which is when Jimmy Carter gave a speech, and I can't remember when, but he said, essentially, there's, there's something wrong with America. There's a, there's a malaise, there's a problem with America. And Ronald Reagan fired back that, that actually there's nothing wrong with America, right? That it's a, it's a great country, it's a positive country. And Johnson, articulates that, he reflects that, uh, that, that instinctive belief that actually we should look more at the better half um, than the other half. And I think that is really what's behind his appeal. Okay, thanks Matt. We have time for just two more questions. Um, the gentleman on standing up there on the right, and can I have the lady there with the blonde hair, Jethro. Thanks, yeah. um, um, we'll start off. Thanks. I've heard what you say about Boris's popularity. Um, I come from a blue wall seat and I do not get any of those impressions from knocking on doors. I get very negative comments. Boris is a liar. I'll never vote for Boris. You know, his majority in our constituency was absolutely slaughtered. 
So what advice would you have for constituencies like mine? I'm in Surrey. Okay, great question. Thank you. Um, sir? Yeah, thank you. I think uh, everyone's enjoyed the uh, event today. Um, if you think early on in your conversation, you mentioned about how Britain's brought to the world you know, the idea of democracy and free market capitalism, which built the modern free world, which of course the US has been a good defender of in the post-war world, but we're wobbling now. Um, I think the time is about Britain should, instead of looking in on itself, which I know some parts of the population think we should, but we should stand up more in the world to defend those values, especially against more emboldened autocratic states that we've seen uh, building at the minute. Okay, so should Britain stand up in the world against autocratic states? Okay, uh, advice to blue wall MPs. Frank, do you have any thoughts on this? You're knocking on the doors and they're saying we don't like Boris. He's not an asset in this area. What, what do the Tories do about that? Um, it's, it's a challenge. I am surprised that Boris does better in traditionally labor areas than he actually has some trouble in traditional conservative areas. And I, I've seen it. I've actually talked to voters. I've had these discussions with them and they get angry with him. You have to be prime minister of the entire country. And this is a warning to you all. This is a time of wonderful celebration. What happened in 2019, you get once a generation. You had it in 1979, Labor got it in 1997, you got it in 2019. The way that you got it was to be a national country, uh, have a national election, a national party representing enough of everyone. But that means that the core conservative is gonna be upset with him because he's too moderate for them. Or he's not, he doesn't push a policy for them. I'm always having to teach those who I tend to agree with, mutual respect is the best word, which is we can't agree on everything, but we agree on more things than we disagree. And the alternative is much worse. I ask you to be tolerant and open-minded of and I know that, I, so I watch facial expressions, and when I said Tom and open-minded, she looks down, because she doesn't really want to hear that. This is how you have the right to govern. The voters give you that right. We're only servants. And as a pollster, I'm only a mouthpiece for the voters rather than for myself. And if we teach more humility rather than pride, if we teach more about empathy rather than certainty, not only will we be a more a stronger party, a stronger coalition, a stronger earning our right to govern, but you will be a stronger country as, as a result. There's too much pride and not enough humility. With more humility, we will do so much better as a people. Okay, thanks. And final uh, answer, Matt, on, on the question of foreign affairs, we haven't spoken about that at all, really. I mean, how salient is it? Because we're doing some quite interesting things in the, in the sort of post-Brexit sphere. Do, do voters actually pay attention to that kind of thing? Well, just briefly before that, just, just to add one point to, to Frank's uh, comment about the, uh, the blue wall seats that Boris may be alienating, um, there is a reason why 20% of Conservative Remain voters stayed with the Conservative Party at the last election. Okay, which is ultimately uh, at the ballot box when it mattered, they put party identity uh, above anything else uh, and they, they decided they didn't want the Labour Party anywhere near power. The Conservative Party, the blunt reality is if the realignment continues, the Conservative Party will lose some blue wall seats to Lib Dems, um, a couple to Labour, not many, but, but the Lib Dems on a good day can probably take somewhere between 15, 20 seats, something like that, um, from the Conservatives. But the blunt reality is that those losses, mainly among university graduates, um, middle class professionals, as we saw in 2019, are actually more than compensated for by gains in other parts of the country. Now, this is a strategic question you all need to figure out, which is what kind of party do you want to be? Do you want to try and straddle those two? Uh, and come up with a message for, for, for both of those areas? Or do you want to keep the foot on the pedal of the realignment and continue to swing the Conservative Party around into, into those new areas of the country? And 
There are a lot more of those areas than there are areas where Boris is incredibly toxic and the Conservatives may lose seats. Trust me, there are a lot more of those areas. Uh, so that's a strategic question for you. And just lastly, on the global Britain, you know, one of the things to keep in mind as well is um, um, to go back to the point that most voters today want to feel good about themselves and they want to feel good about the country. And most of the people that have voted for the Conservatives for the first time derive their sense of status and esteem from the country, right? And in, in that they put much stronger value on, on Britain, um, not, not just its role in the world, but, but feeling proud of the country and its identity and its history, much more so than, say, the sort of highly educated London elite that typically doesn't, to the same extent, uh, derive its sense of status from, from that. So the stuff that we've seen, you know, AUKUS, uh, the sort of talk about global Britain, Johnson on the world stage, I think helps underline some of that. I don't think the new conservative voters are mad um, uh, in inter interventionists, internationalists that are watching every twist and turn closely. I think they just want to see the country doing relatively well compared to others. Um, they are quite instinctively suspicious about things like international aid, not because they don't support it, but because they're not convinced it's being used in the right way, uh, or has been used in the right way in the past. Um, and I think they want to scale back on some of the more ambitious uh, forms of liberal internationalism that we saw during the New Labour years. And I think there has been a sea change uh, away from that. Um, but I think, again, you know, Johnson so far is doing a reasonably good job of, of projecting that. Okay. But That's a was a rallying cry to end a Conservative event, a reasonably good job. Uh, Sorry. Guys, uh, I'd like to thank you all very much for coming. Please can we have a big hand for our speakers, Frank Luntz and Matt Goodwin.